to change the investment bank, especially in Australia. We've been fortunate enough at Banjo at our office here in Vegas to welcome a lot of you to come by a couple days ago and took a tour, which is great because those of you that are here in the audience, and I see several of you that did take the tour, will be able to tell your colleagues and friends that you've met here in the audience that what I'm about to tell you is not a bunch of BS uh, because it certainly can sound that way. So what, is, what does Banjo do? So like you were saying, we take in all of these signals from around the world, not just social media, I think we're known for social media, but we take in everything from satellite data to traffic data, weather data, financial data. So imagine all of these disparate data streams in the world that are out there, they're circling around us every day, they're just invisible, and we don't usually see them. Well, Banjo captures them in real time, and our definition of real time is live. Not real time is five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, it's right now as it occurs. So in essence, we're listening or monitoring everything in the world that occurs live in real time. But being able to look at that manually is one thing, and it would be impossible. You would literally need millions of people to look at all these data signals to interpret what's going on live. So we've built, uh, internally, we've built this incredible artificial intelligence that's able to take all of these different signals, right? And every signal is structured in a different way, but instantly can make them into the same uh, signature looking of a signal, and then they can interpret what's happening anywhere in the world. So what, is that, what does that do and what does that mean? So our system, for example, someone sharing a social post, a photograph, someone a streaming video, a traffic camera, a satellite, when something changes in the world and it matters, we know about it literally instantly. And so today, over a thousand major media companies in the world use Banjo every day to break the news. I promise you see us every single day. You just don't know that, it, that it's coming from us. So how does this work? So let's just say someone shared um, a video, like a Periscope video. And that video, they're streaming it live. You guys know how Periscope works. It's streaming live, and then it's gone, right? It's not saved. Well, when they're streaming that live, perhaps they're seeing a train crash or derail, and they're taking a photograph of that or a video of that. Our system instantly recognizes immediately that that's a train crash, where in the world exactly where that train crash is happening and where it's at. That information is then verified and sent to a, a customer such as a news organization. That news organization has that information and is able to then start validating and verifying it while the person is still on the scene shooting the Periscope video. It's literally that fast. We break over a million events a year, so think about that number, over a million events a year um, that you guys see and read about and hear about all the time come and emanate from, from Banjo. And so <clears throat> what we're using this technology is not just for the media industry, it's not just for our customers like NBC and ABC and ESPN, but it's also we're doing using it for corporate security. We're using it to find out when people travel abroad what's happening in that area of the world, what's live right now, what happened there last week. And that came all about from how really Banjo started in the beginning, we started as a consumer app because I had missed a friend in an airport and I wanted to never miss out on an experience again if people were nearby posting on social media, maybe on a, on a network that uh, I didn't even have. But what happened was on April 15, 2013, you guys all remember the Boston Marathon bombing. And in that moment in time, I went into our system, it was very manual back then, and I went and said, what's happening in Boston? There are people in this room, I know because I've talked to you, who actually were at the marathon that day. And they said it was chaotic. No one knew what was going on. There was no information. But we knew instantaneously what was going on. And we were able to rewind time and literally go to the street corner of where the bomb was, rewind it back to before the bomb went off, and 42 minutes before, uh, uh, sorry, 42 minutes after the explosion, uh, we identified one of the uh, terrorist suspects. And it was in that moment in time that I literally went to our board that day and I said, Banjo's changing. We're no longer a consumer app. It's still available in the store even to this day. We were Apple's app of the year and Google's app of the year, but we haven't even updated the app in over three years because in that moment in time, I knew our mission was to build the world's first crystal ball. And what I mean by a crystal ball is the ability to know things before anybody else, right? Imagine having the power in your hand to know anything happening in the world that matters to you doesn't have to be breaking news, it could be a, an event, a concert, it could be traffic at the airport, whatever matters to you in your business. Imagine knowing that before anybody else. 
And so the goal was to take what happened that day at, at the Boston Marathon and be able to have a system, artificial intelligence, do all of that. Like I had to query a system. I shouldn't have had to query a system. I had to rewind time and look through thousands and thousands of images and videos from the Boston Marathon, and I shouldn't have to do that. So how could you teach a system like a human being to sift through all that information instantaneously though, and use the same sort of reasoning and thought that a human being does and come up with answers? And so today, we always, that's how we're known. We tell people we've created the world's first crystal ball because literally, for those that came to Banjo, they saw, Every day, thousands and thousands of events before you know about it, before the media knows about it, before any newswire knows about it, before Wall Street knows about it to trade on it, we know about it. And we use that information then for financial services or the media, like I've said, now corporate security, big brands, we've, we've done things as big as the Super Bowl, um, uh, et cetera. So what does this mean for uh, many of you in the audience who have a small business? How can this technology be used? So sure, we're using it with today thousands of big corporations, but it really, how is it going to impact the consumer and how is it going to impact small businesses? Today with a small business, for example, you don't have the ability to, when you start, to buy like a Bloomberg terminal. It's too expensive. Or if you want to get some kind of research report, they're too out of reach, they're too expensive, hard to get to. So imagine having all of that kind of information that was live, that just mattered to you, and get rid of all the other noise. Imagine having that very inexpensively and without a lot of work. And so today we've built something called the rules engine. It's just a name internally, it's not a sexy name at all. But, but what, what a rules engine does is I literally can say something like, hey, um, go to this part of the world, look around these stores, if any of this kind of thing happens through this kind of imagery, or if this logo shows up, or if this kind of action happens, or if a police car comes in the frame, if any of these things happen, I need to know about it immediately. For that, for that exact part of the world, or for any part of the world, these set of rules happen, I know about it instantaneously. It's just that easy. It's common sense language. You're just talking to a machine, and it's spitting back out to you real, these alerts. And so imagine knowing, as a small business, what's happening around your competitor stores, where your customers are, where your likely customers are at. If you're advertising, are people even taking photographs uh, of the areas they're advertising. Is it showing up in social media because people aren't hashtagging? People aren't in Times Square's hashtagging the Coca-Cola billboard there, but yet it's shared literally tens of thousands of times a day on social media, and they don't know about it, but we know about it. Every time any type of major brand in the world shows up in any video or anything, we know about it. Anytime any object shows up, any type of car shows up, any type of person shows up, we know about it. So imagine knowing that for your small business and having that advantage, not just advantage from your competition, but your advantage to the customer, the end user, the person that really matters. And so I'll leave you with this thought with, with how we, um, what we're really doing. At the end of the day, we're changing the way we consume time. So time hasn't been messed with in a long time. And the reality of it is, what do, you, what, do you, what do I mean by that? So today, when you get something from the news, you think, oh, I'm learning this in real time. But the reality is it's, it happened over here, right? The event. So this oil pipeline exploded somewhere, and you're learning about it on CNN. And it's still burning. So you think, oh, this is happening right now. The reality of it is CNN knew about it 15 minutes before you found out about it. It took them that much time to prepare the story, verify it, et cetera. They found out about it from a source, right? That found out about it, et cetera. And you keep going on down the line until the actual pipeline exploded over here. This is truly real time, it's live. This is our perception of real time. This is what we deal with every day in life. Unless you're physically on the scene of something happening or you're watching a live event on TV, which is even delayed, our perception of time and what true real time isn't. So in the fact, if you knew everything that was happening over here, in the moment that it happens, think about that, and the moment that anything in the world happens, what's happening at Disneyland right this second, then you would actually know what we perceive as the future. Even if that future is five minutes from now, 15 minutes from now, et cetera. That oil pipeline is, is, is a real example. We detected an oil pipeline exploding in Saudi Arabia. It took 52 minutes from the time that we detected it and we gave out the signal for the trading triggers in Wall Street to go off and the brick crude oil futures traded that day, uh, I think it was $3, $3 higher. 52 minutes. Imagine if I go to uh, a hedge fund right now and I say, hey, in 50 minutes from now, this pipeline's gonna explode and you can trade 
and it's going to make this money. They think I was crazy. But that's the reality of it. That's what I mean by changing time. So our time at Banjo today, everything we look at, everything we do in our lives, before I go to the airport, I want to know what the line's like at TSA, especially with the craziness that's going on right now. Like, how do you know that? Right? We go. We utilize our system, and it tells us how long the line is, right? We utilize our system. It tells me what the traffic is really like on the way there. Yeah, sure, Waze or Google tells you there might be traffic, but why is there traffic? Should I detour? Is it an accident? Is it a cop giving someone a ticket on the side of the road, and they're just doing looky-looing, and I, I might as well just go that way as opposed to detouring and missing my flight? All of those simple things in life that we take for granted and not having enough information, this is what Banjo allows us to do. So anyways, I'll leave you with this one thought on, on a company here in locally in Vegas. We're here in Vegas. Um, we're also in Silicon Valley. But our large operation center that's open 24 hours a day, and for those of you who didn't have an opportunity to come and visit us, uh, I, do, I, I do invite you there. It's a secure facility, so you'll have to apply ahead of time. Uh, but when you come in there, I think you'll, be, you'll have that holy shit moment, right? Um, because really, when you walk in there and you see all of this happening in the world in real time, not on TV, but just through the data and the signals of what's happening, and then you see it pop up on TV 30 minutes later, it's, you start to change your whole perception of, of the world and, and what that means. So let's start out with this. I wonder if we can look at maybe three distinct periods of your life, and if you can say something from that time that sort of prepared you to be an entrepreneur, or left you with something that you still kind of draw on this day let's say, from your time as being uh, a punk rocker in LA, when you were squ a squatter, when you were working in the pit at NASCAR, and when you were a crime scene investigator in Davidson, North Carolina? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like I told the group of military veterans I had the honor of speaking with yesterday at, at, at lunch, um, you know, I chose to be homeless. I chose to leave home at 15. I chose not to go to high school. Um, my parents are great people. Um, I love them dearly, but I, it just wasn't, hanging out at the house wasn't for me. So I did, I lived underneath the freeway underpass for years, um, squatted in abandoned buildings. And you know, that just taught me, it, it taught me how to be really street smart. And I, I think we, we could take that word for granted, but literally how to fight for things. Um, I didn't call home in years. So it's not like I had money and I had access to money. I fought for every dollar I earned, every dollar I got. Uh, by any means, uh, how I ate every day. Uh, I was a lot thinner then than I am today. Um, but um, so that just taught, it just taught me survival skills and something that, you know, I probably didn't have as much, even though my mom was a survivor in the sense that she was raised in an orphanage in New York City. And they kicked you out back then around 16 years old, gave you enough money for a bus ticket anywhere you wanted to go. So she lived on the streets for a long time as well and then built herself into who she is today, which is amazing. Um, and so I guess I wanted to follow in those footsteps and learn that journey of her life because I didn't have that experience growing up, right? Obviously, I grew up in a great household. We were lower middle class, but still. Um, and so I learned, I learned that in that experience. And then um, he said NASCAR pit crew. So NASCAR, you know, I bring a lot of what I do in Silicon Valley and when a lot of what I do in running our company, um, I attribute to NASCAR. Why? For those of you who've ever watched racing, understand that the pit crews are extremely talented in the way they can go over a wall during a race. All these different emotions happening, the car coming, speeding in at you, you're hot, maybe you're frustrated, but yet you have to perform this act, this pit stop in, in seconds, literally 11, 12 seconds, or else it's the difference between you winning a million dollars that day and winning $100,000 a day, and I think like most of you, I'd rather win a million dollars a day. And so, it's about knowing, though, what the people next to you are doing in that pit stop because shit happens constantly, right, and that you weren't planning for. And it's about preparing for the unknown all the time. And we do that in Silicon Valley, and I do that with engineering, I do that with non-engineering, and I'm constantly preparing for the unknown and the unexpected. And so people all the time will say, oh, you guys got lucky on this, you got lucky on that. And I say we prepare ourselves for the, that luck, right? Yes, the opportunity came along and we didn't know it was gonna come along, but it was due to the preparation that we had done that we seized the moment. And to me, being an entrepreneur is all about seizing the moment and the opportunity when it comes along. We can try to force it to come along, we can put ourselves in that position, but sometimes it just comes along. And those 
that have succeeded time and time again, you see and you look at their stories. They may not talk about this, but if you look at it, it's that they were prepared to seize the moment at that time. And that's what NASCAR really taught me, and I think that's why we've been uh, very successful in that organization. I mean, crime scene investigation, um, why did I do that? I mean, I, I, like I told the group yesterday, I just wanted a badge and a gun, right? <laughs> I mean, and I wanted to try it out, and it was a lot of fun to have a badge and a gun for a while. Uh, some days I still pretend like I have, I guess, a badge and a gun, but... Uh, that, that, that could go in the wrong direction. It could go, saying. but uh, at, at the company, um, I use a lot of, you know, you start using a lot of deductive reasoning, the way you analyze a problem, the way you're looking at a crime, the way you're looking at solving a crime, is a lot of the way I, we look at today at architecting our system, solving the system. It, there, it could be the, one of these four outcomes. How do we use deductive reasoning to get to the, the true outcome as fast as possible without spending too much time chasing the wrong evidence, the wrong, um, the wrong path? And so that, I'd say that's how those three areas of my life have helped me and, and what we do today. One thread that read through your story, um, which you already touched on, is incredible resourcefulness. Um, and one of my favorite bits of the big story we did on you a year ago was where you went to San Francisco just kind of out of the blue, entered two hackathons completely out of the blue, no, knowing nobody in town, and won them both, which to put that in its pr proper perspective never, ever, ever happens. You know, you're entering these hackathons against these teams of engineers that have been working together for years. But what I just learned yesterday was that one hackathon in particular, the Google one you won, you had a very unique strategy to, for winning. Can you talk about that? So, um, so my girlfriend who's in the audience, uh, we've been together more than a decade now. Uh, obviously I have commitment issues. Um, so <laughs> we, when I went up, she's the one who signed me up. So it's not like, it's not like by happenstance. Like she said, hey, I signed you up for this hackathon in Silicon Valley. And I, hey, wait, what the hell's a hackathon? Um, and she's like, you're gonna go against all these engineers. You think you're badass, but let's just see. And I said, that's, uh, that's great. So I, I actually wasn't gonna go, and she convinced me, and I drove up there, and I won one. And then the next week was the Google Hackathon that I got invited to, and I think there was about 300 engineers. And they were from Twitter and AMD and Yahoo, and they brought teams. And these teams of people already had these baked ideas of what they were gonna do once, Twitter, uh, once Google told them, this is the problem we want you to solve. Well, I looked around, I didn't know anybody. Um, and, I, and I just said to Jennifer, I said, listen, here's how it works. They're gonna parade us up on stage and go in front of a lectern like this and you're gonna be able to say what your idea is. And the Google executives and the venture capitalists that are in the room that are gonna judge this after 52 hours are going to pick, I think it was 16 different ideas out of 300 that you're gonna go forward with and then they form teams around that. Well, I was an outsider, no one knew me. I, there was just no way they were gonna pick my idea because I saw people from Google, like I said, Yahoo, they were gonna get their ideas picked. And so I said, you know what? This is a room of mostly guys, mostly engineers, mostly venture capitalists. My girlfriend's good looking. If you go up there and you tell them it's your idea, I don't care how good or how bad it is, they're gonna pick you, I promise. And I'm not saying that they picked her because of that, but somehow she got picked. Um, <laughs> so when that happened, um, it, was, it was amazing because all these engineers gravitated to her to be on her team. And she pointed at me and she said, no, go talk to him. And, and, that, and that's the, literally how it got started. And then, of course, you know, it was about um, you know, leadership and bringing that team together. People I, all these people, I had no idea who they were. And then building this incredible idea, uh, which even Jennifer, my girlfriend, helped me with, and then, and then winning that day. Um, and then I actually raised about a million dollars I mean, from that, so. Fabulous. So let's fast forward to right now. Um, as I mentioned in my intro remarks, it's been quite a year or so for you. Um, raised $100 million, you've signed on a ton of clients, um, which you can tell us about. But you and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, you're now moving from, here's this really cool startup with this amazing idea, to now there's real money behind it, now there's a real board involved, now we gotta make it a real business. Can you talk about those challenges? Yeah, so it's, it's actually somewhat harder than I thought. I've, had, I've owned several successful companies that I've built from the ground up in different areas from retail to construction to manufacturing. And 
but all of them I made profitable within, I think, the first year. I think every single one of my companies were all profitable the first year. And Banjo, we just burn cash. Um, because we're building such a big idea, as I talked about in the beginning, and it requires a lot of R&D, because it's something that's never been done. There's no roadmap. And so this went on for years, literally, for the last four years. Engineering, data science, our entire company, no sales, no business development, and zero marketing people, all focused on building the future. Is it going, are we going to be able to achieve this? And when we did, now it's about changing that mentality to, we have to split the team in, in essence. We have to split the company because now we need half the company supporting us becoming a company and a business and a sustainable business and a profitable company. But we still, we want to make sure that we sustain the R&D nature of us and continue pushing the bounds of science all the time uh, so that we have competitive advantages always coming online in the future. And that splitting of the team, and it's not really, it's not like you take half the team and divide them, but it's like, how you move people one direction and the other. How do you motivate people who every day came to work because they were working on the cool new thing. Now they're working because they're sustaining a thousand companies that we've signed up and they're sustaining that business channel. And that's a very different mentality. And to some people it's just not as exciting, especially to scientists and to some engineers. And so it, it's been a challenge. It's been a, it's, been a, it's been a challenge to our culture. It's been a challenge to um, the way we do business every day, it's been a challenge to motivate, it's been a challenge to me as a leader um, to actually learn more about how do you lead through these times. I mean, the good news is we have gone from, I mean, last time we met was like December, I was with you and I think we had 40 or 50 customers and we're over 1,000 now, six months late, five months later, um, and growing by you know, a dozen or so a week. So, and we still have no sales, there's still no sales department, although that's a mistake, I need to bring in sales in the company. Um, but it's, it's, it's really hard. It, going through this transition is really difficult right now. I guess um, I want to leave ample time for questions for the audience, so let's do this one quickly. Can you identify one challenge that you've been focusing on that you've found a way to overcome, perhaps? Yeah, I think <clears throat> for us it's having one type of group of people, so engineers and data scientists, and now you start bringing others in the company who don't have that background, who don't talk that nomenclature. And the culture and the nomenclature of the company is that, right? Because, and it just doesn't have to be in your lives, it doesn't have to be engineering or data science, but you're, you've had one group of people and one thought process, not one thought process, but you know what I mean, coalescing around one main idea. Now these new people are coming into the organization. And you don't want it us versus them. It's, this is a team sport. That's why our email is Team Banjo. It, it, this is everybody together. But bringing these two different cultures, if you will, together, when, some, when the one culture is already so strongly rooted, and it, and it starts with me, right, uh, because I'm, I still run engineering to this day, um, and so it's my responsibility and it's my leadership that's going to enable that to make it happen, but then I need the other leaders in the company and, the, uh, and all the people in the company to want to accept that and bring that together, and, and it's challenging, it's harder than I thought, and, and the bigger thing that, I, that maybe some of you can take this away and it'd be helpful is... You know, when, especially when you're a sole founder and when you're the leader and you're still a very active leader in the company, meaning you're like me in engineering and stuff every day, they're going to look at you and how your emotions are and the things that you say and the things, your impressions on your face. And you've got to be cognizant of that. And some days I forget that. And that really helps shape the company culture. Like, I love our culture. I think we've done a great job. But now we have to change things. And we have to change things for the better. Uh, and that starts with me, and it's about not forgetting about that and not forgetting that we have a greater responsibility because all of these people that work for you gave up other opportunities, right? They quit jobs, they moved their family across the United States or from another country, and you have a responsibility to them to make it as the best company. You have a responsibility to yourself and to your investors, so you just never forget that, and, and it's hard. Um, as with every time I sit down with you, I feel like we're just scratching the surface, but I really want to uh, let the audience ask some questions. Um, so I think th there are two mics going around. I see a hand over there. There's one down here. There's one over there. Wow. Let's start with you, sir. Hi. Thanks for uh, your presentation. It's so inspiring. My question is how much mindfulness and work, I don't know how you'd quantify this, but how much mindfulness and work went into protecting what you guys do and provide from getting into the wrong hands like the Joker, the Riddler, countries like Fat Bastard, without naming them. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So we actually spend a lot of care in, in doing that. Our vetting process is rigorous. Um, we talk about 1,000 customers today. We'd probably have, this is no exaggeration, 5,000 today if our process wasn't so rigorous. And what do I mean by that? We vet out every company and organization that applies to use our service because we don't have a sales team. So no, we don't go out and talk to anybody. Everybody comes to us. Um, we validate and verify who they are, what organization are they are with, what, how are they going to use it. And we made, we made a call long ago that we wouldn't work with government agencies. Uh, and the reason why is not, as a military veteran, I'm very supportive, obviously, of, of our military and, and protecting our security and having a powerful tech, uh, technology like this. I'm not naive to the fact of what this could do in the wrong hands, let alone the right hands. Um, and so we do spend a great amount of care on privacy. I think it's one of our, the biggest things that we're known for at Banjo uh, is the amount of uh, one third of our overhead in our non-human non, um, uh, being capital, but one third of our overhead, machines, security, everything goes to protecting privacy. And that's a lot. And we're, we're talking millions and millions of dollars a year just in protecting privacy. And, and, and so that's how we do it. Thanks for your question. Great. Don Hi. Um, putting aside that you seem about five minutes away from creating person of interest, um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you is when you have that much data coming in at once, what kind of process do you have in place to help your clients not confuse um, correlation and causation? Yeah, great question. So we actually have, um, if you came to a, a tour banjo, you'd see we have a last line of defense. And in that last line of defense, it's human still. And so while people say, how can it scale with human beings? Well, it has to. And the reason why is because with the media, the media now trusts us that when it comes from us, it's been verified already. And when they get that story, they still have to do their job as a journalist before they put it on air, but it's without giving them noise. So I can tell you there are, there's other companies that do event detection and they might just listen to Twitter and look at keywords. But because of that, they're giving out 30, 40% false positives every single day. So imagine in a million events a year, like I said, that would be 400,000 false positives a year. It's too much noise. For us, we've had two false positives in the entire history of our company, right? So it, it, it just never happens. Why? Because we built this last line of defense on top of the AI, a human element. And when I say a human element, it's five people. Five human beings are able to get us down to two false positives uh, in all of that. So the noise that they're getting it doesn't exist. And the stories they're getting are validated and, and they matter to them. Uh, and we measure that and we're constantly tweaking. I mean, just this morning before I got in here, I was on with data science and engineering talking about a new model we're going to put out today for object recognition to ensure that, the, that noise levels even to our team would go down. So it's a constant battle. Like you said, the amount of data we pull in, would, it would literally, mine would explode when you see it because mine still does every time I see the bill. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's how, that's how we're doing it. Thanks for the question. Hi, thanks a lot for a really inspiring and uh, eye-opening presentation. Um, I'm in the mental health field. And one of the first things that kind of popped in my head is whether it's suicide and depression or uh, overdoses from drugs, et cetera, I'm almost seeing that there's potential here to identify when those events happen long before would typically happen. I mean, somebody typically might have a picture of it happening or some other data source long before they call 911, et cetera. Mm. And I'm wondering if you ever thought about how to use it in that context, <clears throat> saving lives directly in that way. Uh, so the, the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, and, but he, here's the reality of it. And, and I hope that as you as entrepreneurs out there know this lesson already, I still seem to learn it every day and it's kind of like deja vu, but you can't chase the shiny new object every day. And what I mean by that is when you have something like Banjo, there is so much, every one from your walks of life in here are different than mine, right? You have a different experience. Mental, mental health industry, you're right, this could absolutely be used for it, and it will be used for it. We focused ourselves today on making sure, we call it the North Star, the, and we make sure that we're gonna achieve that North Star, and that's creating the crystal ball. And now we're creating it as a platform so that anybody from any industry, any vertical, mental health, financial services, travel, things that we haven't got into, they can easily tap into this technology and build whatever they want on top of it. They can, again, go to it and query with normal language without having to be an engineer and say, these are the things that are important to me. If these type of things happen in a picture or a video anywhere in the world or in a certain area, if these type of words show up, if these type of slang happens, if this type of logo happens, I want to know about it for my vertical, for my business. And that's what we're going to make available to everyone 
um, hopefully within short order. I mean, it's available now to some because we had to focus. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're, that, that we're not concerned or we don't care about your industry or, and many of yours out there. But we would fail as a company if we tried to do all things at once and be all things to all people. We just want to, we want to expose our technology for what it can do. That's why we use the media, right? Because it helps see every day, wow, that's amazing how you could break that story. But Banjo's not about breaking stories, right? Just like I said, it's about knowing anything before anybody else to make better decisions as you as a human being. I don't want to replace you with, with a computer. I just want you to have better information right now so you can make a better decision for you and your customers. Question right there. Oh, sorry, yeah. Damien, Chris Cody, I had the chance to be over at your place on Tuesday and I too had my holy shit moment. What you guys are doing is, and this word gets tossed around a lot, truly disruptive, so congratulations on making your passion a reality. My question is around the backdrop of censorship. So it's slightly different than the question you heard earlier. Facebook has been accused of that, I think we've even won the last seven or so days. How do you guys balance or provide the barriers to what makes it through and what doesn't for political gain or harm, financial gain or harm, et cetera? So, um, yeah, that's actually, uh, it's a great point because um, I don't believe in any censorship at all. Um, and that's, um, you know, we get asked all the time about helping political candidates for office, right? Um, and I refuse to have our company play any part in it one way or the other. Now, like you mentioned Facebook, people, curators looking at content, deciding what goes through, everything goes through a banjo, literally. Um, and it's, it's really what the company subscribe to, what they want from us is what they see. But you won't find a story, for example, I'll just take a political example, because that's what's been in the news, right or left. We're not here to report the news. We're not here to create a title on something and swing something one way or the other. We're here to give a signal out. That's it, a signal. And what you do with that signal is up to you. And so there is no neutering, if you will, or, and there, there is no, um, uh, someone's not sitting there uh, as a sinister, uh, with a sinister plot to say we're gonna swing things one way or the other because uh, I can assure you that all signals go through and, all, and, and that's, I mean, that's our business, right? Our business is signal detection. Um, we haven't gotten even into the practice of how do we even mute certain signals from happening, uh, and I don't, and I don't want to get into that practice, right? Because, um, and that's one of the reasons why we've chosen not to work with certain types of uh, entities um, to prevent us from doing things like that. And it's hard. I mean, we've had, I don't want to name names, but we've had presidential candidates themselves come into Banjo here in Vegas, um, and we had to decline helping them, and that's hard because you're looking at might be the the future leader of the of the free world and you're telling them that you're not gonna help them. Um, and I'm not gonna, not gonna lie to you, it's, it's tough. Um, and, but those are those decisions that we as leaders have to make every day. We have to make the tough decisions. That's why we get out of bed and do what we do. Hello, I'm Patrick. Uh, thanks for your story. It's, it's amazing, really inspiring. And thanks for your service. I'm a veteran as well. As veteran as well yeah, thank so you for yours. Thank you. Um, Two questions. First thing is the two people, or you said you have a team of five people that filters everything. Did you fire the two people that actually let those two stories go through? That's the first question. The second question is how do you actually monetize what you do? Yeah. So um, I fired a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's just reality. I've actually fired, for as big as the company is, I've probably fired as many people. Um, and I, that's not a negative way. We have to make those hard decisions. Um, did the people get fired for making that mistake there? The answer is no. Um, we all make mistakes every day. None of us are perfect. Uh, if, they made, if the same person made the mistake and let both those go through, yeah, they'd be gone. Um, but that's not what happened, right? We have to all learn from our mistakes, and you got to give, I think you have to give everybody an opportunity to learn from mistakes. If they keep repeating them, of course, then you should be probably making better decisions uh, on who you hire, right? So, as far as like how we, would you say, how we make money, um, so it's, it's different for every type of entity right now. So for like the media side, they subscribe to the signal, right? They subscribe to getting stories that matter to them. So if you're the BBC, you might just care about things in, in Europe. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you care about the whole world. If you're a local NBC station, like here, we, 
uh, we have with Sinclair Broadcasting, the NBC station here in Las Vegas, they may care about things that are happening mostly in Vegas, but if it's a big story, a big signal internationally, like the Egypt plane crash today, or nationally, like something going on in the election, they want to know about it. But everything else, we quiet all that noise. So they're paying for the signals that they ingest from us. Corporate security, same thing. If you're a corporation that owns 1,500, I'll call it retail outlets in the United States, and you want to monitor what's happening within a kilometer of those retail outlets, traffic, crime, et cetera, then you're subscribing to just that and you're paying for just that. If you're a big brand like one of our customers, Bud Light, and you want to see where your logo is showing up everywhere in the world, because they have no idea. Where are people just drinking a Bud Light right now and it's showing up in photos and videos? They don't know, right? So we charge them for how much photos we have to process in order to get to that information. So it's based on the different types of vertical, but ultimately everybody's just paying for the signal. We try to make it super easy um, and, so, and not complicated, and hence the reason we don't have a sales force yet. If you as an entity out there were to subscribe to Banjo today, I can tell you right now we just onboarded um, the Weather Channel, for example. The Weather Channel was onboarded from the time they signed the contract, which actually took a long time because they're owned by IBM now, um, until they actually got turned on, from turned on, we're talking minutes. I mean, I think all, all training told and the Weather Channel go live on air with our stuff. Maybe they have, we have 30 minutes into them as a customer. So we, that's how we've, we've streamlined our, our process and how we charge. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Fabulous. Uh, over on the right, left for you guys. Good, mor good morning. In an age of constant, instant facts, and the impetus to react instantaneously? Are you concerned about the loss of thoughtfulness and wisdom and judgment? No, and that's because, like I said, I'm not trying to replace, I, and, I, and I don't want to replace anyone out here in the audience and their business with a machine. I just want to give people better information to make better decisions. When you talk about thoughtfulness, I, I like to think I'm thoughtful, and I would think most of you as entrepreneurs in your business are thoughtful, thinking about the future, the implications, what you want to do, just where you want to take your company, what's the next company you might want to start. Um, but no, I don't, I, don't, I don't worry about the things that have yet to come, because if we, especially from the technology side, if I sat there and worried about everything that might happen, I probably wouldn't innovate. I'd get, I'd get stagnant, because I'd be worried so much. So I really just, I lead my life of not worrying about much. Now, if something happens and there's negative implications because something we've done, then absolutely, I take action immediately without question. Uh, but I try to live my life without fear or worry of, of anything. Uh, time for one more in the back. Hi, thank you. So if you could give one bit of advice to a entrepreneur who's on the verge of scaling up. I mean, you went through that and you said several things about your culture and how important that is. But as that occurs, what advice would you give to an entrepreneur to prepare <clears throat> to scale up and you know, create the kind of company you've created? So, charge, right? Just go forward. There's no way you can prepare enough. And I see it constantly with new entrepreneurs. It's procrastination, right? Because they just, I haven't prepared for this, I, I need to launch this. These people, when I launch it, it needs to be perfect. You know what, at the end of the day, nobody gives a damn, right? They're not gonna remember your mistakes, you're not gonna remember uh, your mistakes, but you need to make those mistakes. And so the more time you procrastinate is the less time that you're going forward and moving forward. So when it's time to scale, of course you should think, you should think through, what does it mean to scale? Who should I be hiring? What systems do I need to have in place? But ultimately, you have to move forward. You have to execute. Ideas are cheap. Execution is what is key. Regardless if you succeed or fail, and I, and I choose success, um, but you have to move forward. And don't get paralyzed in that, you know, you're worried that what the impression of your business or you is going to be if you fail at this or if you don't do this, because people don't remember. I promise you they don't. And I look back on all the times that I procrastinated on things and I think about how stupid I was and how I, I could have saved minutes or hours or months of agonizing and stress and gray hair if I had just moved forward and learned along the way. And so that's what I would advise you. Just, just charge. Charge that hill, put, plant that flag up there, and just own it. Awesome.